Welcome to everyone in third annual lecture of Journal of Asian Art, Culture and Literature. Today we are having eminent guest Mr. Amita Sukta and Dr. Bishaka Sharma will be moderating the session. So before uh, Bishaka Sharma starts to introduce sir, I will quickly like to introduce our moderator Bishaka Sharma. Bishaka Das Sharma, a doctor in linguist from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, specializes in the documentation of endangered and lesser known languages. She participates in several national and international seminars of languages and linguists. She has a number of research publications to her credit. Being a passionate writer and poet as well, her poems and articles are published in many anthologies and journals. She is an administrator of Asian Literary Society, editor of Journal of Asian Art, Culture and Literature, and she regularly moderates panel discussions on various literary themes. Now I humbly request Bishaka Sarma to kindly introduce our today's eminent guest. Greetings viewers, my fellow writers, academicians and friends. Uh, on the Christmas Eve, the Journal of Asian Art, Culture and Literature features the third annual lecture on a significant subject, new ways of seeing, a transformative thinking approach. Friends, how we perceive and form ideas on things in and around our life. And we often fall into a trap of prejudice because we learn to look into things from one particular direction. Thus, it is essential to go beyond the obvious and embrace what it is rather than what it appears to be. So stay tuned. Our distinguished guest of this evening will unfold a transformative thinking approach. But before that, I would introduce you all to him. Mr. Umid Das Gupta is a former 1979 batch Indian Foreign Service officer, a graduate of St. Javier's College and Jawaharlal Nehru University Mr. Das Gupta served in various capacities in India during his diplomatic career, including Cairo, Brussels, Kathmandu, Berlin, Sydney, and Manila. He was also ambassador to the Philippines. A published author, Mr. Das Gupta's latest edited book is The Phoenix Rises, Lockdown Chronicles. He has a number of other books to his credit, the most recent ones being The House and, the, and Other Stories, Lessons from Ruslana in Search of Transformative Thinking, The Strategic Shape of the World, India for a Billion Reasons, The Divine Peacock, The Perennial Tree, Indian by Choice, and many others which are published by HarperCollins, Sage, Wiley, etc. The recent book published by Wisdom Tree is Why We Fail. He is also currently working on a fiction titled A Quiet Noise and a non-fiction title Did You Polish Your Shoes? He has written for academic journals, civil society magazines and newspapers on matters related to foreign or security policy, management and leadership issues and on education and government policy. In 2022, the Australian government appointed Mr. Das Gupta as an honorary member in the General Division of the Order of Australia for his contribution to strengthening India-Australia relations and in the setting up of the Australia-India Youth Dialogue. He is also a distinguished fellow of the Australia-India Institute and a senior fellow at the Society for Policy Studies. He currently serves as a director on the board of University of New South Wales Global India Private Limited and the strategic advisor for the university on its India engagement program. Welcome on the forum, Mr. Das Gupta. Thank you very much. And um, it's been a very generous and a very kind introduction. 
uh, let me begin by uh, extending warm wishes and greetings to, to you and to all the viewers and supporters of this extraordinary forum on the auspicious occasion of Christmas. I'd also like to wish everyone a very happy new year. Don't know when we'll catch up again, uh, but most certainly uh, I, will, I will be looking at the Facebook page to see the comments that people make on this evening's uh, event. My thanks also for the honor that you have extended uh, for me to speak at this very engaging forum, uh, which I have been part of, thanks to Bishaka, uh, for some time. The topic that you mentioned is a problem that I have been thinking about for, for quite some time. And its basis really is the presumption that for most of us, our mind is already made up. You see, the mind is like, it has, uh, it's like a supermarket. And uh, we have mind boxes, if you like, inside our head. And just as you visit a supermarket and you want to buy toothpaste, you know where to go. On the other hand, if you want to buy butter, you don't go to the section which sells toothpaste. Your mind is programmed in a manner which allows you the ability to pluck from your mind, so to speak, perceptions which have already been formed. You see, all of us have an opinion about everything. We have an opinion as to whether Messi is a better football player than Ronaldo. We have a view as to whether Sachin Tendulkar is a better cricket player than Garfield Sobers. We have a view as to whether chocolate is bad for health, whether WHO messed up the entire handling of the pandemic. We have a view as to whether God exists. And so for everything, and even more, our mind is already made up. We have a view. We have a view as to whether Muslims are terrorists, because the majority of terrorists are Muslims. And, and these ingrained ways of seeing is what I'd like to speak about today. You might, you might wonder as to whether this is really true. And let me start by, by interactively engaging you in a bit of storytelling and possibly a game. Let's say you have a very dear friend. And uh, shall we call her Shalini? Okay, so let's call her Shalini. So Shalini is a very close friend of yours. And uh, you and Shanali, Shalini get along. But Shalini has another friend. Um, let's call her uh, Sujata. She has another friend called Sujata, whom you don't like. You have a problem with Sujata. You have a problem with the way she talks, the way she dresses. You, you find uh, her company quite boring, and you don't enjoy it. One day, Shalini tells you, Sujata has invited both Shalini and you for a cup of tea at her house. Now, you don't want to go because you don't like her. And 
you think it's going to be a complete waste of time. After all, the conversation is going to be boring. She's going to, uh, there's nothing about her that engages you in a manner that you would. But anyway, you go there. It's a, it's a house much like yours. It's a flat. And you sit in the drawing room and uh, uh, the lady comes uh, and, and, and there's tea being served and there's some samosas and uh, Sajata is sitting there, Shalini is there, and a couple of other friends are also there. And as you would expect, Sajata is very badly dressed. You know, her, her hair is all messed up. And uh, you just feel pretty awkward about it, that if she's gone and invited so many people to the house, her house, I mean, she's invited them, you haven't forced yourself. It's her invitation. Should she not have dressed up properly? And the house itself also looks very unkempt. So your opinion of Sajata keeps getting entrenched. I mean, you never liked her anyway. And there is no reason for you to change your mind. When you hear Sujata say, you know, I'm so happy that all of you are here. And Shalini and I go back so many years, been friends since childhood. And I told myself that if Shalini is coming and Shalini is bringing some of our friends and uh, other friends over here, Manika is here, Arundhati is here. We're all friends. And so I don't need to really bother about how I look. And you see, this chemotherapy that I'm going through, I've lost all my hair. And the doctors have told me, I just have another few weeks left. And so, when it was time for you all to come, which was five o'clock in the evening, at 4.45 in the evening, I got out of bed. I have had some medication. I picked up the nearest wig and put it on my head. I know my clothes are all crushed, but I also know you'll forgive me. Now, when you hear her say this, your mind does a dramatic shift. It's almost a shift by 180 degrees. Because from one way of perceiving Sajata, this single piece of information about her dying of cancer and that death is imminent makes you go all the way to the other side. And you tell yourself, why did I hold it against her? After all, she did have very strong reasons for not really caring about how she looked. And yet, she made the effort to invite us all over to her house, perhaps for a last goodbye. Now, if you were to begin with the first thought that I suggested to you, which is that our mind is already made up, and then you take the second thought that I'm suggesting to you, which is that we can change our mind, and that we can change our mind completely, go in the exact opposite direction of what we had started with then you really have a possibility of recognizing that we can think differently and that we don't need to have entrenched views about things. Now, as a, as a sociologist would tell you, you know, there's a man called Peter Berger, who's an American sociologist. And he argues 
that our lives are social landscapes. Now, what did he what did he mean by that? He said, in as much as we can be influenced by the physical landscape, and there's there's a lot of evidence to say that people who who live in Uh, are very different from those who who live beside the sea or the ocean. The physical landscape impacts the way you think and the way you see. You know, people will tell you that if you're from the northeast of India, places like Assam and Nagaland, Sikkim, Meghalaya, Mizoram, <coughs> the people would be very different from those who are in Haryana or UP. Uh, Uttar Pradesh or Bihar, and uh, the physical landscape impacts you. And Peter Berger argued that it's not just the physical landscape, but the social landscape that also impacts your mind and the way you see things. You know, so let's take an example of this. In the in the lexicon of sociologists, this process by which we are taught to think and to behave in a predictable manner is known as socialization. So from, from the very birth of a child, the parents, and thereafter the peer group, Thereafter, the school, uh, which has a very strong influence, actually grooms the child so that the child fits into society. Now, if you, if you were to go to places like Saudi Arabia, for example, the women would compulsorily need to dress in a particular manner. It would be totally inappropriate for a man to open the door of a car uh, for a lady to enter and to shake hands with the lady when he meets her. Now, the socialization process, in other words, teaches you norms, mores, and patterns of behavior that are recognizable and that are acceptable. Right? So, once, once you're able to say that it's recognizable and acceptable, any action which is not recognizable and is unacceptable is then referred to as deviant behavior. And deviance always attracts punishment. So let's, let's explore this a little bit. So what it means is that if you're living in society, you are expected to think, to act and behave in a predictable manner. And if you don't act, think and behave in a predictable manner, then you are actually challenging the social order. You're disrupting the system. And nobody likes disruption. And if you're disrupting the system, the only way to bring you back into the system and thereby maintain social order is through punishment. So there was an uh, eminent French philosopher by the name of Michel Foucault. And Professor Foucault argued that punishment is used as a deterrent. Now, in Saudi Arabia and certain other Islamic countries, for example, if you were to steal, your hand would be chopped off and it would be done publicly or you would be publicly flogged, right? Now, what, what is the purpose behind this? The purpose behind this is twofold. One is to tell the thief that the action that you undertook is against the norms the mores and the patterns of behavior that are societally acceptable. 
So you stole and therefore you need to be punished. And punishment then will deter you from stealing again. But more importantly, it will deter potential thieves. Right? So when you do that, you maintain social order. Okay? So we are taught to think in a particular manner because that's how societies survive. And we are taught to think in that manner. Do not challenge the social system. Now, let me, let me throw in, if you like, a spanner and, and, and try to complicate it a little bit more. See, if I were to sit with you and have a cup of coffee, and we're talking side by side, you know, in front of each other and uh, they're chatting. And I, I ask you, what do you think about old people? You're likely to say, I think they're wonderful. There's nothing wrong with old people. I mean, I, my grandfather is very old. I love my grandfather. My grandmother's very old. I just adore my grandmother. She always makes these wonderful things for me to eat, which brings back so much of my childhood memory. Right? So many of us would react <clears throat> in a very positive manner to a question like this. Similarly, if I asked you, what do you think about children? And you might say, oh, I love children. It's so nice to see little children running around, playing. I just adore children. Now, there is, there is a, a thesis that even good people do bad things. Uh, let me try and explain this a little bit more. You see, studies have demonstrated that even those who say we love old people and we love children actually don't. They actually don't like them because they find old people are slow. They're hard of hearing. Um, they always need looking after. And if you're in a hurry, they're always getting in the way. And the same thing with children. I mean, you want to sit down and work on something, and the children are running up and down. They're dropping things and breaking things. If you ask them to have their dinner, they don't have the dinner. They're throwing the food around. They're crying because they need attention. They're grabbing your remote control when you want to watch soccer they actually want to watch cartoon network and you can't stand it and and this is a series of studies have demonstrated that even good people like yourself and so many others do bad things they harbor thoughts now where did these thoughts come from these act thoughts actually came from from two processes. One is what I mentioned, which is the, the socialization process, where you're taught to think in a particular way. And the other is an accumulation of your personal experience. And I think this word personal experience is important because it is what, what uh, Peter Berger said, is that it's, it needs to be a biographical approach to life. It's how you live it. You know, so your interactions, either with your neighbors, with the community, uh, with the family, with the school, uh, the peer group, institutions you deal with, we, we go through life doing all this. And that helps us make up our mind. So it's a combo, if you like, of these two factors, A, how we are taught to think, and B, how we learn to think. And we combine these two together, often reinforcing it. Now, I don't know if you've, if you've uh, read a very powerful book written uh, several decades ago. You might not have. It's by a man called John Howard Griffin. And it's one of my favorite books. It's called Black Like Me. And John Howard Griffin, wanted to study racial prejudice in the United States. 
he was a white man and he he did a lot of studies but he he never felt comfortable about what he did and so he met a few doctors and friends and he underwent for a very short period you know he underwent through the consumption of some chemicals a pigment transformation uh, griffin by the way died of skin cancer um, uh, as a result of these experiments but he being a white man when he had these chemicals he would look very dark and uh, he started pro american african american population the black community and he would tell them that he was black now the black community didn't know that he was actually white the white community didn't know that he was actually white and not black and Black Like Me is a book about his experiences. And what he discovered was that the white community had ingrained misperceptions about the blacks. You know, the blacks, and they had these stereotypical views. Oh, the blacks, they're dirty and they're filthy. They rarely have a bath. Blacks are great musicians. They're very great lovers. The blacks like to eat fried chicken. The blacks are violent. They break the law. The blacks are known to be people who can have extreme acts of physical violence against women and others. Almost all, uh, the majority of people in American jails are blacks avoid the blacks and these became very hardcore perceptions that the white community grew up with of course you, you all of you are aware of of slavery of uh, the kind of history uh, the black history as they call it uh, that the united states went through and through the powerful writings of, of several people through the music uh, that came out during that time. And John Howard Griffin, through his book, actually tried to expose what it really felt being black. And uh, it's a very, very powerful uh, book because it's a, it's a very personal experience that he talks about, um, how he uh, sits at the pavement and... Uh, and he's got this shoe shine box with him and a, a white man whom he knew uh, but who couldn't recognize him comes and puts his shoes and asks him and uses the derogatory n-word you know nigger boy polish my shoes and um, it's the contempt the hatred the racism that he talks about now but if you if you were to put this in context of what i'm talking about you actually see a perception a perception that a people have about another people and another people whom they're actually living with because the community actually brought the whites and the blacks together it's not that it was it was Somalians talking about the Swedes. No, it's people who were living together in society, the American society. You can fast forward this a bit and uh, you, you will recall how, how during the period of the Third Reich in Germany, in Nazi Germany, how the, the infirm, the elderly, the gypsies, the homosexuals and the Jews were perceived. Under Hitler, Nazi Germany saw these people as being un-German-like and they were irrelevant. They were actually people who did not allow Germany to flourish and therefore they could be exterminated. Six million were gassed and stories of how brutally they were treated 
including with tattoos on their arms. Deprived and denied of food, the torture that they went through. And this brings me to the second part of what I wanted to speak with you about. And I talk about transformative thinking. So if we start with the, with the perception or start with the idea that we all have a way of seeing the world. The Nazis had a way of seeing this, this category of people, you know, as I said, the infirm, you know, the, the elderly people who were sick. Uh, they had no place in modern Germany. Or the who were sick and uh, who were homosexuals because uh, who were who were gypsies, you know, who didn't lead a life of discipline, and of course who were Jews. And uh, so, if we if we take this way of seeing, the question we are confronted with is: Can we see differently? And let me continue a bit on this theme of the Third Reich. There is a book that I, I have been in love with for, for decades. And I read it first when, when I came to Delhi from, from Calcutta to study at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. And at that time, uh, on, on Janpat, uh, you know, they used to sell books uh, beyond the, on the pavement. And uh, one of the books I picked up because the title sounded fascinating and was a gift to me uh, from my father's elder brother. The book was called Man's Search for Meaning. And the author of that book is Dr. Victor Frankl. And uh, uh, Dr. Frankl started the third Viennese school of psychotherapy. Um, and uh, his, his argument really is, and he, he calls this third school logotherapy. And uh, his whole argument, really, if I can summarize it, is that the choice that the Jews had, and he was, a, he was by the way, he was a, a Jew. He and his wife were picked up. Uh, he's an Austrian Jew. He was picked up. And they were put into two different concentration camps. And, uh, and Frankl, as a psychiatrist, as a practicing psychiatrist, uh, started to, to study the patients, uh, study the, the prisoners, his fellow prisoners, and started to study himself. And um, he found almost all the fellow prisoners were in the same situation as he was. They all had loved ones who were in different concentration camps. And as you know, in these concentration camps, the conditions were extremely harsh. And uh, if someone fell sick, uh, the, the, the Nazis just gassed them. They took them to the gas chambers. And they would be stripped of all their clothes, and then their naked bodies would be thrown in a large pit. And um, so all of them were, so they, they, they worried, you know, if someone was in Auschwitz, uh, wondering about what's happening in Buchenwald, someone was in Sachsenhausen, so what's happening in Belsenberger. And, and so people were really scared and worried. And the moment they got news, that their wife or their father or their daughter or whatever was still alive, they felt happy. And they lived every day waiting for news about loved ones. And uh, Frankl found this fascinating because what they did in that particular moment is that they didn't allow the situation that they were presently in, you know, the, the torture that they were going through. Uh, they were made to march and walk for, for hours on end without shoes. 
their feet would have blisters, that the flies, that the infected blisters. Many had typhoid. Um, they hardly got any food to eat. You know, so if someone got a potato and another person didn't, uh, they would share. They lived in very large dormitories and um, they didn't know when was the last time they had a bath. And if they were asked to go and have a bath, they knew that they were being sent to the gas chamber. Because from the shower, water would not come out, but only poison, lethal gas. And they didn't let that situation, that horrible situation, overwhelm them. on their wife, on their daughter, or whatever, the other family member. And the news that they were okay suddenly made them feel alive. So in man's search for meaning, what Frankl tries to argue is that we need to find a purpose in our life. And that the only thing the Nazis could never take away from the prisoners was the sense of purpose. And that it was a choice that the prisoners had. Some could exercise it, some could not. I mean, six million people died. Frankl survived. So did many other prisoners. I mean, the Russians came in. Um, the Russian tanks rolled in and went into the concentration camps. And the, the images that you see, and they were shocked because it was just skin and bones held together of people who survived. And I've met a few of the uh, Jewish survivors from, from the concentration camps. And uh, they, they're extraordinary people. Let me share uh, uh, one of the one of the incidents, two of the incidents that um, Frankl talks about. So there was this prisoner who came to Frankl one day and said, "Dr. Frankl, I know when the war is going to end." And Frankl said, "Are you sure? I mean, how do you know?" He said, "God spoke to me." He said, God spoke to you? He said, yes, in my dream. God came to me in my dream and gave me the date and the time when the war would end and Germany would be defeated. And the man was very excited. And uh, because he knew the war was going to end, God had spoken to him. I mean, no one, not another human being, but God himself had come and told him. But as the date started approaching, there was no sign of the war ending. Germany was already on the march. Most of Europe had fallen. And when that date arrived and went, and Germany still was there, the man's health started deteriorating. And he finally died. And Frankl says that if you look through the German medical records, the cause of death is recorded as typhus. Whereas in Frankl's mind, the man died of a broken heart. The one reason that he had to live taken away from him. Even God had betrayed him. So he had no reason to live. And so Frankl says, unless you have a purpose, unless you find the meaning to your life, life is not going to be worth living. And the situation will overwhelm you. He shares another example which is very interesting, where he, because he's a doctor, 
and uh, he's a psychiatrist. A Gestapo officer, uh, who was probably a little kinder than the other Gestapos, says to Frankel that there's a, there's a woman prisoner who's dying, and she's dying of cancer, and uh, she doesn't have much time to live. Why don't you just go and meet that lady, and perhaps comfort her? And Frankel doesn't know what to say or what to do. So he says, okay, I go. And he goes to this lady and he sees this very emaciated woman lying on the bed. Uh, it's a strange kind of room. It has one window. And uh, she's just staring out of that window. And uh, so he holds her hand in his. He doesn't speak. He just looks at her. And after a long pause, the lady says, most of my time, my waking hours, talking to the tree outside. And Frankel bends down and looks through the window and he can see a branch. And on the branch, he can see some leaves and two blossoms. But he thinks that the lady's gone completely mad. And he says, oh, you speak to the tree, do you? And what does the tree say? Does the tree talk to you? And she says, yes, the tree talks to me. And the tree says, I am life. I am eternal life. After a couple of days, the lady dies. And Frankl records this conversation and he says that despite the cancer eating into her she found meaning because that tree transformed the way in which she saw her cancer so I have now placed before you uh, two things one is that how we see the world is to a large extent um, extent it's, it's it's programmed you know we're taught to see in a particular way our mind is wired to think in a way in a particular way to act and behave in a particular way at the same time i have posited that there is a possibility by which you can see things differently if you decide what your purpose is in life. And when you put the two side by side, you can actually embark on a different kind of journey. One is, of course, the common life that all of us lead. You know, so I lead my life following a particular routine and a discipline that has been externally imposed on me. It's not an internally imposed one. It's externally important that I have to behave in a particular way, act in a particular way, talk in a particular way, and, and, and be predictable. And the other, the other journey is when I suddenly stand up and I tell myself, I'm not going to let this situation overwhelm me. Because there is something I want to do in life, which, which I find far more satisfying. Let, let me give you an example. <coughs> it is said that that Van Gogh, the, the Dutch painter, uh, that um, he was, of course, he had mental health problems. Um, on one occasion, he, he cut his ear off, um, story goes, out of jealousy, and, and, and gave it to, to a lady that he was in love with. Uh, and, and Van Gogh's brother, Theo, who loved him, very much, didn't quite know how Van Gogh would lead his life. I mean, he, he tried carpentry, he was he worked in a church, he worked in a bookshop, but Van Gogh was unhappy, and his mental health problems had become very acute. And But when Van Gogh sat down with some charcoal and, and a canvas, he changed. He he, he became very different. 
and he he wrote to his brother Theo, whom he loved very dearly, and said, you know, I want to paint. I want to become a painter. And Theo said, if that's what makes you feel happy, please go ahead and paint. And it is said about Van Gogh that when he sat in front of the canvas, he lost track of day and night, hunger, thirst, and sleep. He would paint and paint and paint till the canvas was over to his satisfaction. Now, this immersion that we are talking about is a, is a unique feature. The, in, in Christian theology, they talk about immersion in Christ. So what they do in Christian theology, I mean, this immersion in Christ is that with whatever you see, whatever you see, whoever you see, you see Christ in it. Rose or a waterfall or another human being, you see the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Christian theme uh, was really, you need to immerse yourself in Christ. Now, this is not alien compared to uh, the other religious traditions that are there. They say about Sri Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa, for example, that what he experienced when he saw the image of the goddess Kali was a sense of Anand. You know, this Anand, this sense of incredible cosmic joy actually filled him. And this cosmic joy is akin to what the Christians say is emotion. So he felt so deeply taken in by the goddess that in everything, all he saw was the goddess. There is a, there is a, a poem by, by Rabindranath Tagore, and I'll, I'll try and do a quick rough translation of this. But he writes that a moment comes in our life when you open your heart and the universe flows into it. So before I end, and I think I might be exceeding my time, and Vishaka can correct me, is I'd like to leave three thoughts with you. Because I believe that human behavior comprises three different forms of action. The first is passion. Passion is doing what you love, loving what you do. Van Gogh sitting in front of his painting. The second is dispassion. Dispassion is the ability to do whatever you want to do without expecting predetermined results. You know, you don't pick up the cricket bat in order to bat like Sachin Tendulkar. You do not start learning how to sing vocal classical music so that you can become Bhimshen Joshi. Dispassion is the ability to stand apart. In Buddhist philosophy, in Zen, they call it equanimity. And the third critical element is compassion. Compassion is the recognition that whatever you do impacts other people. So unless you, you create this sense of linking yourself with other people and making this bonding part and parcel of life, transformative thinking cannot be achieved. Vishaka, do I have another two minutes or would you like me to stop? Uh, no, yes, uh, you take two minutes and wind up, sir. Wonderful. So I'll, I'll leave one story with you, uh, which combines passion, dispassion and compassion. 
there was a Zen master gardener, and uh, he he was teaching his disciples about Zen philosophy. And Zen is a state of consciousness. That's the exact translation of the word Zen, is a state of consciousness. When you suddenly become acutely aware of, of a lot of things that you might not normally be aware of, sounds and aroma and what life is all about. And so he would teach his disciples. And he had a garden in the back, which was unkempt and dirty. And there were some dead trees. And his Zen master, he started having a dream for two, three nights in which he dreamt of the most beautiful garden. And he said, you know, I'm having this very strange dream. And when he was meditating, he saw the garden again. And he said, there must be something to it. So he told his disciples, I don't want you to go to that backyard garden. And he spent months and he recreated the garden that he saw in his mind. And when it was done, he sat down and looked at it and told his disciples. And they just couldn't believe what they saw. They said, Master, this is, this is magic. And uh, a few days later, these disciples, when they were sleeping, they heard the sound of axes being hit against trees. And they rushed out to the garden. And they found the Zen master destroying the garden that he had made. And they said, Master, what are you doing? You are just destroying the most beautiful garden. And the master said, I saw the garden in my dream. I recreated it so that you could see it physically. Now it resides in my heart. It has no longer a place on earth. It's a combination of passion, dispassion, the ability to let go. You know, you all know the story of Kisa Gotami, who went to the Buddha with the dead infant in her hand and said, Lord, give, give this child life. Bring my child back. And the Buddha said, go and find from the villagers a handful of mustard seeds where no death has ever taken place. And when Kusajotami could not find a single household and bring the mustard seeds, she realized that opposites live side by side. So you can, you need not be overwhelmed by either grief or by joy. That is despair. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll end here. I'm very happy to take questions. I, I do apologize if I have bored you, and I most certainly apologize for having exceeded my time. I thank you <laughs> so much, uh, for having invited me to this, uh, to this event. And uh, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. And, uh, thank uh, you, sir. Uh, to uh, wind up, I quickly want to ask a couple of questions which are actually popping in my mind in the server, yes, you know, please. giving this insightful speech. Basically, uh, the one was uh, in the first half, you're talking about the perceptions. So at personal level, we know that uh, it takes a long time for changing the perception about a person. But at society level, what take triggers, you know, to make change in the perception? So that was the one thing. And second thing, I also want to add that you have given a lot of references of, you know, Jewish Buddhism or our mythology or our gods, these things. So with these uh, lot of new, I mean, you know, re revelation coming with these James Webb's telescope, we are seeing the end of uni you know, universal universe, you know, many of us are, you know, kind of very difficult for us to uh, see the God in the same sense we have been see reading from our childhood. So what is your perception about the God? Uh, so these two things were actually coming in my mind and though they are not very much aligned with the topic, but still actually, I, I think it's a golden opportunity for me to ask you one to one here. Yeah, so on, on, on the first question, sir, my, my, my basic belief is that society does not want you to think differently. 
society wants you to think along the lines that it has taught you to think. Uh, you know, when, when, when Galileo had the argument about the world being, uh, being round and instead of being flat, uh, it, it was a challenge for people. And, and because the society grew up thinking that the world was flat and he challenged that particular uh, thought process saying that it is not built on fact, uh, but that it is incorrect. So I don't think society will encourage deviant thinking. Uh, Steve Jobs, for example, uh, since you are in computer software, I would mention this to you. If you look at uh, computers, not now, but if you had looked at computers before, one of the things that made the Mac stand out, Apple stand out as compared to any other brand, is that if you have to open a laptop, a Mac app laptop, your Apple symbol doesn't face you. It is it faces you in the other direction. And the reason why he did this is that when you open the laptop, the persons sitting on the other side see that you have an apple. If you compare it with the, at that time, whether it's Dell or HP or whatever, when you have to open it, you actually saw HP written on it or Dell or whatever it is, you know, the brand was. It was visible to the person who was using the computer. And when you opened it, it became upside down for the persons who were not visible, not, not using it. The point I'm trying to make is that small revolutions that were done transformed existing paradigms and existing systems and ways of seeing, but there's always resistance to it. The, the second question that that you asked me as to who or what is God and what is our image of God. I'm not a very religious person, nor indeed was my father. And uh, the altar that we had, but he used to pray every day. The altar that we had, we had an image of the goddess uh, Kali, and there was Durga, and there was a Ganesh, there was Krishna, uh, there was a Jesus Christ, there was a Buddha. And I asked Baba, I said, the, you know, uh, what is God? And, and he told me, God is what elevates your mind. And that is God. And I was, I was a young student and I was reading the poetry of William Wordsworth at that time. And I said, you know, Wordsworth's poem elevate my mind. And he said, well, those poems then are God. I said, would you mind if I put a a collection of words, words, poems at the altar. And he said, by all means, do so. But please also remember that one day you will evolve beyond words, words. And that day someone else will replace words. And it did. It did. I think God is how you, you feel about God in your own heart and mind. And uh, the whole aspect of Viktor Frankl's man's search for meaning was that meaning is God. You know, when you discover meaning in life, that itself is God. And and, and that meaning you can, and, and, and if you combine it with what I said, compassion being part of it. Um, you know, Hitler found meaning in life. Hitler had a lot of passion, didn't he? But he had no compassion. He had no compassion. So it's an integration of passion, dispassion, and compassion. And I believe, I believe, and I can be wrong, I believe that God is what makes you that next step higher in your eyes, not someone else's eyes, in your eyes. And um, I don't know if I answered your question. No, sir, definitely. And uh, you actually replied it, but which basically what I wanted to hear. And I see many people had the similar questions on the God, you know. Uh, this question actually uh, came in many people's mind. I see the uh, uh, comments. So, uh, Bishako, would you like to proceed with? Yes, I would say that it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful, thought-provoking <laughs> speech, a, a talk. Uh, <clears throat> so I really loved what you said. Uh, you said that we should all have a purpose in life. I would like to repeat a few lines. You said that there, it's important that we should have a purpose in life, like we should wake up with a dream. 
and uh, you you ended your lecture saying that we should have an equanimous mind i believe which you have you have also discussed about passion yes i do believe that why uh, what we are looking for is actually what do we what we human beings seek for happiness so how can we be happy i think it is important for us uh, to have an equanimous mind and then we can be happy no i i agree with you you and know would you like I mean, to say anything yeah the, the new book that i have just finished which is why we fail you know there are lots of books on success and uh, western thinking uh, if you like uh, in my view distorts definitions they again try to force you to think in a particular manner and and one of the things they do is uh, they look at life in terms of uh, what 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 i would i call the binary uh, thought process so you have success and therefore you have to have failure which is the opposite so it is dichotomy that they see you know so uh, you can understand day if you understand night you can understand good if you understand bad right so they see opposites and uh, the definition of success really is because most western societies are capitalist and they are materialistic the definition of success is the positions that you hold in power the social position the power you from money you know and 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 so the more money you make the more successful you are and and money is not something you keep in the bank money needs to be visible in other words you own three iphones you own a bmw and a porsche and you live in a big house which has a heated swimming pool people are able to see this you know so you look at all the advertisements and and reality television and there there are there are a lot of books on this which debunk this kind of approach to life now when you take this kind of approach then what happens is in binary thinking you say if you cannot get all of this you are a failure so it's the exact opposite the other argument <coughs> that i make in 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 why we fail is that a lot of us <coughs> sorry a lot of us are actually living up to the dreams and expectations of other people you know we grow up and and we decide to become a doctor because ma or baba says i'm a doctor we have a a medical practice you should become a doctor we are not chasing or following our dream we are following someone else's dream and uh, jean paul sartre has has a very powerful line he says hell hell is other people and it's when you when you combine all of this um happiness uh is is a different state of mind it's a state of mind right and uh, according to the buddhists you know um and 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 if you take the story of kisa gotami uh the the profound joy that a mother feels when she holds her infant child for the first time is is as deep as the profound grief that she feels when she has to cremate it when she has to cremate the child you know the two opposites which are there birth and death are juxtaposed in buddhism and in hinduism to be able to say you should not get overwhelmed either by sorrow or by joy and the real happiness comes when you are able to discover equanimity not just for yourself not just for yourself but combine it with compassion so that you are able to spread this equanimity and joy to other people Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is wonderful, sir. Thank you, and uh, thanks to the viewers too. Uh, they were uh, they were actually giving so many comments, and I'm sure they liked your uh, talk. There's so many comments out there. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, sir. So we end up this session, uh, wishing you all a merry Christmas and a very happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for inviting me. God bless you. Stay safe, stay well, and stay kind.